Good evening and welcome. I'm Professor Andrew Lynch, the Acting Dean of UNSW Law and Justice. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are respectively gathered tonight, whether that be across Sydney, throughout the state of New South Wales or all around the country. And I also pay my respects to elders both past, present and also emerging. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us for this special event. I'm honoured to welcome all of you to our fourth Mason Conversation a series named in honour of Sir Anthony Mason, marking his outstanding uh, contribution over decades to UNSW and in reflection of his distinguished career in the law. The Mason Conversation is a unique event in which we explore the life experiences of public uh, lawyers and intellectuals in Australia and hear their reflections on contemporary issues and public affairs with a particular focus on a life lived well in the law. This year's conversation is particularly significant as we celebrate the 50th, 50th anniversary of the faculty. Since we began teaching in 1971, the faculty at UNSW built on a steadfast commitment to intellectual ambition and the pursuit of social justice has carved a distinctive place in legal education. Sadly, we have had even more reason recently to reflect on that history with the passing away of our founding dean the remarkable and great Hal Wooten, ACQC, at the end of July. We hope to be able to hold an event to celebrate Hal's life and contribution to UNSW when pandemic restrictions have eased. But for now, I would just like to flag with this audience that the annual Hal Wooten Lecture will be held online this year on the 12th of October, with details to be available shortly on the faculty's website. I hope that you can join us for that event. But now to tonight's own very special proceedings. Before giving a brief introduction of our distinguished guest, I also introduce my colleague, Professor Rosalind Dixon, well known to this audience as the director of the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law. Unlike an address or oration, a conversation is a relaxed exchange between individuals. And tonight, Rosalind is the other crucial partner in our Mason conversation. My thanks to her, and her centre colleagues for the preparation of this special event. And with pleasure, we welcome Her Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, ACQC, to join us uh, for this conversation tonight in our anniversary year. Her Excellency is the 39th Governor of New South Wales, having commenced her five-year tenure in 2019. Prior to her appointment, her Excellency enjoyed a long and distinguished legal career spanning 43 years, during which time she served as a role model for women in law at both the state and national level. Appointed Queen's Counsel in 1989, in 1993 she was made a judge of the Federal Court of Australia, the first woman to sit exclusively in that court. In 1996 she was the first woman appointed to the New South Wales Court of Appeal and subsequently was the first female appointed as its president. Her Excellency was made a companion of the Order of Australia in the Australia Day Honours of 2020 for eminent service to the people of New South Wales, particularly through leadership roles in the judiciary and as a mentor of young women lawyers. Your Excellency, thank you. We are so honoured and delighted to be joined by you tonight. And it's with great pleasure that I invite my colleague Rosalind to commence the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for that generous introduction and Your Excellency for joining us. Uh, I, like Andrew, would like to acknowledge that I am joining this uh, from Indigenous land and pay respect to the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on the central coast on which I am joining this meeting from and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging and to any First Nation colleagues joining us this evening. This is an absolute delight to be joining Her Excellency in conversation. Uh, before I start uh, us down the tour of celebrating a life in the law lived well, I just want to say a couple of thanks in addition uh, to those that Andrew has mentioned. First to uh, Tom Chapman and Danielle Peake in particular here at the Centre and the faculty who've done a wonderful job organising this evening along with the Governor's uh, efficient and uh, generous staff. 
And to the people who founded this tradition, which, um, as Andrew said, is in its fourth iteration, uh, my colleagues, John Brennan and George Williams, and of course, to our advisory council for their guidance. Many of the people on that council are former colleagues of Her Excellency. I want to thank, of course, Danny Gilbert for the amazing support of uh, the firm for the GNT Centre of Public Law at UNSW and our chair of the advisory committee, uh, John Baston, for his guidance. Uh, I want to thank Justice Baston and our Chief Justice, um, Chief Justice Bathurst, for their generous uh, willingness to host this evening at Banco. Uh, imagine yourself as you're here this evening on Teams uh, in that glorious courtroom. Uh, and I want to thank them for their hospitality and generosity, as well as uh, Justice Katzman, Justice Perry, Justice Armstrong, Justice Speech Jones, who I note has uh, just been elevated uh, to the Governor's former court. My congratulations, Judge, as well as Kate Richardson, SC, uh, Professor John McMillan and President Croucher for their amazing support and guidance. Tonight, of course, is a celebration of Sir Anthony's career in the law. And in preparing for this evening, I asked Sir Anthony for any recollections he had of the Governor. He remembered her as an outstanding uh, counsel who appeared before him with great distinction and a leader of the Court of Appeal who he thought of as especially outstanding in her guiding and leading that court. So Governor, if I may start our conversation by asking you whether you have any reflections of Sir Anthony uh, as a judge or as someone who you have no doubt had many professional interactions with. Oh, absolutely. I can always remember uh, one of the messages that I got from Sir Anthony uh, very early, um, and it was a message, it came indirectly to me, but it was probably, you know, with one of my very, very early, early judgments. And as a new judge, you know, you're sort of brandishing the pen and uh, trying to really demonstrate, you know, that uh, sort of what you are and what your legal knowledge is and how you deal with something. And the message came back, don't write too much. And I thought that was fabulous advice. Um, it it wasn't to say that you don't, you can't explore ideas within a judgment, but it certainly uh, was telling you to keep your, you know, his message to me was make sure you stay on track uh, because at the end of the day, a judgment uh, has to decide a particular issue or a number of issues, and it has to give a determination for a particular individual. And the the individuals who are at the end of the judgment, that is the parties, they really need to know why it is that their, their result is as it is. And if you really use it as an occasion for your own intellectual flights of, um, not flights of fancy perhaps, but flights of interest, uh, then I think there is, you, you can tend to overwrite. There can be a tendency not to uh, really think about the end product. And I think that was, as I said, very good advice. Um, always kept it in mind. Always, I think, to me, meant that your judgments had to be very understandable. Uh, again, understandable at the other end, the, the client end, and very, when I say client, the clients who were the, the parties. And I think it, it was always also an admonition to sharpness in your judgment, getting to the point. Well, it's always a great compliment uh, if in your early days, Sir Anthony is writing to you and reading your judgments. And it, it, I've read some of your subsequent articles and addresses where you've carried that through with you into talking about minimalism and, and the balance between giving adequate reasons and, if you like, overwriting or giving too many. But I also want to take you back to earlier in your career you know, Sir Anthony's talked about your career as a barrister and, and your distinction there, and no doubt there are many young barristers joining us this evening. Do you remember any particular cases early in your career as especially formative or ones that you remember as particularly challenging, interesting or significant? I'll mention a couple, uh, which in many ways were of no sort of major significance but which for me were huge learning experiences uh, as an advocate, because I went to the bar so long ago that there were no such things 
uh, as a training for advocates and uh, the Chief Justice and John would be uh, with me in that sort of same same category. And you really just very much learned on your feet. I had one occasion, it was still under the Matrimonial Causes Act, and there was a particular judge in the Matrimonial Causes um, Division who was uh, pretty much gave everybody a hard time, um, but particularly gave women a very, very hard time. On this particular occasion, interestingly, I was acting for a male. I, I remember the detail of this almost down to, you know, the submissions I made. He at the time was um, paying $3 a week by way of child support. I came out of the court having with an order against my client, uh, which had tripled it, went up to $9 a week. But it was the way in which he, the, the judge dealt with me as a barrister. Every time I tried to open my mouth, he bounced me from floor to ceiling, floor to ceiling, floor to ceiling. And I could bring my word out, it, it was really a very tough day in court. But I came out of that thinking to myself, $9 was, was probably not a bad result for my client after all. And although he didn't particularly think so. But I also thought, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to let that happen to me again. And it taught me at a very early stage that there were ways to handle judges and ways to handle different judges with respect to my colleagues. <laughs> I'm sure people uh, have said this about me. And I think that's that becomes important as a young advocate. You take every tough occasion to, um, to, to really, to be a learning experience. And even with all the advocacy teaching in the world, nothing really teaches you like being on your feet. The other case I had was in federal court and uh, it was before the wonderful Justice Shepherd. And he, it was a tax case, a, a state tax case. Couldn't have been a state tax case, I was in the federal court. Um, and my opponent started, I was acting for the um, taxation department. And I, I probably have a visual sort of mind and I can still visualize as my my opponent, my friend, my learned friend was making his submissions. It was as though I could see Justice Shepherd being pulled across the court in front of him and agreeing with absolutely every submission that was being made. And I know you're supposed to go into court knowing how you're going to present your case, but you, you still need to be pretty flexible. And I was just sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? How on earth? And I'm getting back into the middle to at least listen to me. And so went back to basics. I started with the legislation. And we won that case at first instance. Uh, on appeal, we lost it 2 1. My opponent wrote to me afterwards and he said, Congratulations. He said, We thought we had no chance of losing that case anywhere. And being in the federal court, actually, we've now got a 2 2 decision. Uh, but again, I think that is you, you, you learn, you have to be adaptable, you have to uh, see what's happening uh, in court and you have to be as reactive to circumstances as you are proactive in the presentation of your case. So just a couple of vignettes. I love the image of drawing the judge back to your side, almost physically. Um, you, you grew up in a family where having such a stellar uh, legal career and certainly being in your current office wouldn't necessarily be have been something in your parents imagination uh, your parents um, obviously had less access to the educational and professional opportunities that you've had your father was a, a milkman who worked to support the family what helped get you if you like to the beginning of your professional journey at the bar in terms of role models or your education, what were the early influences that helped you get where you are today? Well, certainly uh, at, at home, uh, education was important. And, you know, I was one of five children. Um, not everyone went to university, but uh, could have if that had been their, their wish. And, you know, whilst we were doing, whether it be going through school, high school, 
uh, and then university. That really took a priority uh, within the family. And, you know, if you really take it right back to the preschool and school ages, you know, my, my mother read to us and with us all the time. And I guess that engenders, um, you know, a, a love of something, a love of learning, uh, a sense that you're supportive in what you're doing. Um, and I think, I, I think that sort of experience is quite irreplaceable, even though it's pretty simple. And it's the sort of experience that goes on in just about every family, most families, you know, that we know. I think at school, I was very lucky to be taught, um, I think all the way through, but certainly my last two years of schooling um, by at a school and by nuns where the whole concept was girls can do anything. And we really were there. And you have to remember, this is still at a time it was only the second year of the Wyndham scheme. And this was at a time when professions beyond teaching and nursing were not so well known for women generally and certainly not not really considered for, uh, you know, sort of girls of, of the background that we were from. And that was not a barrier. We were there to do the best we could to be supported. Uh, it was a it was a, a school where ideas were promoted, where discussion was promoted on a whole range of things. And bearing in mind it was a Catholic school, uh, we, we could uh, talk and we actually had discussions on topics which uh, in those days might have seemed um, anything from, depending on one's point of view, disgraceful to avant-garde, um, from homosexuality to existentialism. They were the topics that we were discussing and writing about and uh, uh, it, it was a very sort of really, I think, enlarging conversation and um, education overall. And I think it's well known, I've always kept in touch with two of those nuns in particular, um, Sister Jude, or Hey Jude, as we used to call her in the heyday of the Beatles, uh, is still alive. She's, I think, 83 um, and still really wonderful. Unfortunately, Stan, or Sister Stanislaus, died uh, of throat cancer a number of years ago in Ireland. But just an education which has just stayed with me. And I think, it's, I think it was the liberating aspect of that education. And again, that sense that we were all there to achieve. And, and not to achieve within within a box. We were there to achieve for ourselves. Well, there's lots to love in those stories. There's the feminist nuns guiding you to professional uh, interest and a liberal education. I mean, one of the things that universities face uh, all around the world is the challenge to the liberal model and to opening up people's minds. And I think that's a wonderful reminder of its value. And no doubt there's some homeschooling parents listening who are very Part and that if you just read some books with your kids, if you don't teach them anything else, they can still be the guffer. <laughs> I want to move to gender. It's a topic that you've talked about. And as um, Andrew mentioned, you've obviously been a trailblazer. You were uh, one of the you know, early female silks. You were the first uh, full-time female judge in the federal court in Sydney to, and the first person to sit exclusively in that court was female identifying you were the first woman appointed to the New South Wales Court of Appeal in 1996 and the first female president of that court as of 2013. What um, you know sort of has been the role of gender in your career is really what I want to talk about and I'm going to read you a quote from an excellent article you wrote in 2003 in the ALRC Law, uh, Reform Journal. Rose Poucher will be happy about that. Um, you said We've come a long way in recognising the existence of women in the commerce of everyday life in all its facets. That was missing for most of my time as a barrister, and it has not been an easy transition, and success is not complete. So, of course, that was a while ago that you wrote that, but I want to ask you both about the progress we've made and what the obstacles might still be. So, what do you think the change is that we've seen from the time that you began your career and got bounced on the ceiling by that uh, rather sexist uh, judge in the matrimonial causes uh, division to now? So what has been the progress that we've made that you've witnessed in the time that you've been a professional woman? The, the progress has been incredible. Um, when I was at law school, um, our constitutional law professor, 
used to call the women in the class girly. The, um, you know, you, at, at the bar there, there were all sorts of barriers. What I began to perceive quite a number of years ago was that the doors had opened. And you can see that in all sorts of ways. Uh, you can see it in the number of women at law school. You can see the number of women um, in academic, high academic jobs. Um, I didn't have a single female lecturer when I was at law school. There, there, was, there was one, I think, at the time, but I just didn't happen to be in her class. Um, you know, so, so, so the male influence was just there all the time. That's just not there anymore. You know, you're standing up, uh, you know, as a esteemed const constitutional law professor uh, before students, male and female, and that's the way we would be. What I did get a sense of um, was that even though the doors were just um, wide open, I did have a feeling that sometimes once females walk through the door, the doors closed again, and that, and when I say closed, it didn't close against them, but it closed them within a, an environment which was still very much male dominated. Uh, it was male dominated uh, in terms of practices, for example, uh, work type hours, uh, you know, were an issue. You, you've got to work extraordinarily hard in, in, a, in any profession. It's not a nine to five job. We accept that when we go into it. But I would hear um, all sorts of stories about um, the, un, you know, really quite unreasonable demands which were being made uh, as to when you had to be somewhere. It could be 4 a.m. in the morning, I heard at different times, you know, and this wasn't even in the MA section. Uh, so I was concerned that access was there, but the way in which um, women uh, were able to work. I heard stories that once women had children, there appeared to be, and this may well go into unconscious bias, you know, uh, I think that is a topic we've talked about in the past. Uh, it was assumed that the, that the mother, the, the lawyer's commitment was less because obviously their commitment would have to be, uh, you know, to the child or to the children. And I heard stories where uh, if you had one child, you felt it, two children, it was happening if you had three children, my goodness, you could not possibly be a committed um, member of that particular, you know, legal organisation. So you still heard all of those things. You move it on hugely, and I think the women at the bar now, uh, you know, women at the bar, they come to the bar, they have children, they take six months uh, leave. You've got to remember they're not learning during that period of time, but these days they're, they're increasingly uh, chambers have systems that support, um, you know, the person while that's happening, including, for example, uh, making licensing of, of chambers uh, easy for them. Uh, if for some reason or other the licensing arrangement doesn't work, the, uh, the floor will, many floors will actually support the payment of the floor fees. Uh, many, many things like that just seem to be happening in a way that, uh, you know, we're sort of light years away when I was at the bar. I, I do think that um, the, the more the problems I, I hear now are still probably around certain aspects of sexism and, 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 and even sort of, you know, sort of a harassment. I do hear those sorts of stories. I continue to hear them. And I think that's made it difficult for women. Um, but let's just hope that provided you're able to have conversations about these things, that sort of culture will change. I think one problem of culture at the bar is that you really are a sole practitioner. And even though people work on a floor and increasingly there, I think that's becoming sort of a more collegiate aspect of, um, of life at the bar, rather than just the, you know, sort of swimming drinks on a Friday night when people got outrageously drunk. Um, 
or some people got outrageously drunk, <laughs> all present company accepted. The, I think there is a long-term cultural problem in people really being in silos and really working on their own and not having the benefit of, uh, I'll call it team pressure for want of another word, you know, the pressure around you where people see conduct and it's made known not to be acceptable um, or people get a sense that conduct may not be acceptable. Of course, if someone knew about it, it wouldn't look too good. And I think those sorts of changes are happening. It's really interesting. I want to come back to the, the sort of team and isolation point and talk about wellbeing in just a minute. But just to round out our discussion about gender, one could think that there are sort of three main obstacles in an ongoing sense, the, the harassment issue that you mentioned, the caring challenges, and then questions of implicit bias. On care, you've obviously raised three wonderful children um, while having such a busy career. Do you have any sort of reflections on what, what you did that made that possible or what you would do differently if you had uh, the chance to do it now? <laughs> that's interesting, isn't it? Um, Not the whole parenting strategy, just the part that's the, the life in the law and the, the challenges you faced and how you overcame them, but also you know, what you would tell your younger self. I had one principal when I was um, uh, you know, sort of at, at the bar and, and also, you know, my, my children were quite young when I went on the bench. I figured that so long as the peanut butter went between the slices of bread and not between the pages of the judgment, I was actually ahead of the game <laughs> because sometimes it was as hard as that. Uh, I would go to work very, very early and because I live quite close to the city, I was able to then go home and, you know, after having done two and a half, maybe three hours work, and then when the rest of the world came alive and the family were up and they needed to be got ready for school and driven to school, I could do that without that pressure that I had to be in chambers uh, to get some work done because the work had already been done. A, a colleague said to me once that they thought that the bar had me about 10 years sleep and that may well have been right. So those things were very different. Uh, I think those times were different. I do think the changes about that I've already spoken about uh, with chambers supporting uh, female members when they are of having, in effect, taking a form of maternity leave, I think that must uh, make a huge difference. You know, to know that uh, you can be away for six months and your chambers are still there, you've been supported. When you come back, you know, you're not considered an oddity, you're not considered not committed, but you, you know, really considered as, um, you know, back in practice would be, is, is a big difference. And what I have taken that, um, just something popped up there. Um, would, uh, months, is that the question? Sorry. Do not we, at all. Right, he's taking himself back out. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, you were saying that the yes, would I have taken that leave? Yeah. One would hope that I wouldn't have been stupid enough not to. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's maybe a lesson in itself that you've, you've got to have the courage in a way and to let go at, at certain times. And maybe, you know, that is a time to let go and have that six months available to you. And, and and take the time. So many of the young women and our silk have done that uh, over the last 10 years that it's actually becoming part of the course. And I think that's just wonderful and good on those women because they're the new pioneers. Absolutely. I, I always tell my students though that I think, you know, I, I worked when my um, son was 10 days old and it's the, the subsequent 18 years that you've got to worry about if we're going to overcome these challenges. But no doubt we can come back to that if there's interest. Governor, you've written about implicit bias. You gave a wonderful speech that you and I had a, a dialogue about some years ago where you referenced a study uh, that involved uh, auditions for an orchestra. It's quite a well-known study, but not everyone is uh, plugged into the implicit bias literature. Can you tell us what the finding was of the study and what you made of it? And then we'll talk about what it means for law. Yeah, I thought it was one of the best examples um, that I had read about implicit bias, because I don't think it's easy to understand. And if you are if you are biased, sometimes 
if you're knowingly biased, you've got a problem. Uh, quite often you just think in a certain way, you think that's a normal way of thinking. Sometimes, uh, particularly in a profession like law, where you, know, you tend to be surrounded by lawyers, your reading tends to be confined fairly much in that way. And I'll make a comment about that in a moment. Um, your thinking can become very structured and in fact, very, very narrow. And people just don't, you know, what does it mean to be implicitly biased? Don't you just have an opinion? So this study was this, it, uh, it was with an orchestra and the orchestra had, I think, something like uh, a 12% female membership, but a very small percentage. And it was noticed and remarks were seen to be made about it. The uh, principal conductor at the time uh, wasn't particularly supportive of women. And he thought that uh, the fact that they could only find in any audition series 10 to 12 percent of uh, suitable female candidates uh, in effect demonstrated that he was right, that females really were just not the great orchestral players of the world. So someone suggested that uh, in the next lot of auditions that they held, and this is a, a significant officer in America, uh, that why don't they um, take away from the uh, knowing who was playing by having the uh, auditioners, those who the candidates who are auditioning, perform behind a, um, a what do you call it, a curtain? A yeah, curtain, yeah. yeah. And so that happened. Guess what the result was that year? 12%? No change. <laughs> no change. The principal conductor is, um, is sort of, you know, fortified in his views. But again, it was noticed that when a male walks across the uh, stage, even behind a curtain, there's a bit of patter. When a female walked across the stage behind a curtain, more often than not in high heels, if it's sound of the heel. So next year. Oh, true finding. Yeah. <laughs> the next year. The performers had to walk across the stage without shoes on. Something like 40-45% of successful candidates were women. And that to me just really demonstrates that, um, you know, sort of because you're setting your views, uh, you think your view is right if you've got nothing against which it can be counted. And I do think that's one of the problems of the law, particularly I think as um, as barristers, I've often thought as lawyers, we are just exposed to so many experiences like this. You know, our whole world widens because every case is different. Every case takes into account um, different circumstances that you wouldn't come across in your everyday life. But because your job is to take the information, to distill it and to put it into a construct which uh, then moves towards a legal consequence, you start narrowing what's happening. In, you start narrowing the thinking process. Absolutely necessary for the way, for the presentation of your case, be sort of unmanageable otherwise. But I think over time that does have quite an impact on one's thinking, unless you're very, very careful, unless you're prepared to continue to keep those sort of, I, I suppose, those ide ideas um, and avenues of information coming to you much more broad. David Gonski, our Chancellor, always tells our undergraduates fight specialisation and narrowness is one of the great challenges of, of a very successful professional career. And I, I think you're echoing that and tying it to implicit bias in very interesting ways. But it obviously does affect, you know, there's a racial dimension as well as a gender dimension in how we assess our colleagues and how we interact in the profession. What can we do about it? Is it just a matter of becoming aware and talking about it and hearing the sorts of examples that you've raised? Do we need to be training people? Does it, is it something where role models make a big difference? I think role models do make a difference. I think uh, conversations are important. Um, I think there's no doubt that, that once women enter the room, if I can put it in those terms, um, the conversations are listened to better. 
Um, I know that there's a lot of talk about uh, women feel that they're talked over and, and things of that nature. Um, I've seen it happen, so it does happen. But, um, you know, the law is a tough profession. We've got to be tough to be in it. You've got to be tough enough, not aggressive, but assertive enough, you know, for your voice to be heard in, in, in your way. And I just think you, in some ways, you stick at it. Um, is it a matter of training? I think examples of unconscious bias uh, are good, and I think it's very, again, terrific to expose people to that uh, because, all right, you, you might have a few old dinosaurs who aren't prepared to change their ways at all, but the more there can be conversations, the more that there is intelligent teaching and training and learning around this, uh, the more people are going to get to understand uh, the dimensions of life um, much more easily, I think, and much better. There are, I'm aware of some social science uh, findings that being exposed to powerful counter models and counter examples has an important um, salutary effect on implicit bias. And no doubt, Governor, if enough people see you in front of the Queen, that uh, in itself will have an important uh, counter uh, modelling effect. You mentioned how isolated it can be as a barrister in the sense of not being exposed to, if you like, peer feedback around your conduct. But another part of that is about wellbeing. And you've written very powerfully and spoken um, out about all the dimensions of wellbeing for lawyers. Obviously, in your current role, you worry about the wellbeing of the whole public. Uh, but you've spoken about the physical, the mental and the emotional and collegiate dimension of well-being for lawyers and judges. Do you think we're doing enough to address lawyer well-being, either generally or at the current moment? That, that, that's, a, that's a big question and in some ways um, it probably has to be broken down in a number of ways. It probably has to be broken down uh, in, in tranches, you know, are we talking about judges? Are we talking about judges in particular jurisdictions? Are we talking about barristers, solicitors, and, and, and the like? Um, we we had a, a seminar on well-being for appellate judges around the country. And I put up my hand and I said, look, you know, we, we, we are appellate judges. We haven't got to where we are unless we're robust. And I do know that everybody under enough stress or should, whether that be work stress or personal circumstances or the combinations of the lot, there's obviously a point for everyone where something could get too much for them. And I think one has to be very sensitive to that. But overall, we're pretty robust. In fact, we should be robust. And I think it's part of that robustness to look after yourself. Um, and I'm not sure that continuous seminars on well-being are the way to go. It seems to me that as part of your well-being, um, what do you do? Do you walk to work? Uh, do you go for a swim most mornings of the week? Um, do you do yoga even? Uh, so tell us about yoga, because you do, you do yoga at Government House, I understand, and you've certainly okay, been known so at Queen Square. Has yoga always been a key part of your well-being? Oh, no, it took my mother years to uh, get me to do yoga, years and years, because I'm fairly active, uh, so I do like to be out and uh, doing things and, uh, and having that active part of it. And I'm not sure what made me think, uh, you know, do, I approached the Chief Justice to see whether we could introduce yoga at, um, at court and I am a convert. Uh, I'm not I'm not a yogi, I don't call myself a yogi, but I do try to do one and two and if I can get to it, three yoga sessions a week and I feel so much better for it. Um, even at a physical level, I was having, of course I tend to write and really tense up when I write and tense up when I'm sort of doing work on the computer. I was starting to have a lot of trouble with my neck and my shoulder. Started having some physiotherapy um, and it was at about the same time that I started doing the yoga. The yoga 
was so much more effective than the physiotherapy. So I started getting physical benefit out of it. Um, uh, the yoga in the court didn't have the biggest uptake in the world, uh, but it did have some. And that in itself became a fun collegiate group. And you'd get to the end of the yoga session and uh, it all almost sort of burst out laughing. It was such a relief from the way that you'd felt uh, on the way that you went into. I think just with the stretching, just with the quietness, uh, just with the focus on trying to get, <laughs> get into a position. I do have to tell you there is a High Court judge who um, is the best. <laughs> they give him all of that. He attends our yoga sessions, um, but it's fun. Uh, it's serious, but I, it's fun if I can put it that way. And uh, it just just really seems to me to be a. <coughs> it really loosens you up. <coughs> Excuse me. If if someone makes a movie that's the equivalent of the RBG movie, that's that wonderful scene where she's working out with her personal trainer. I very much hope we'll get to see a scene with you and the judicial yoga session or the government house equivalent. But you talk about being active. Obviously, one of the things that's really very hard for people in New South Wales at the moment is how many restrictions they're facing. The lockdown is getting increasingly stringent and is going to last a long time. How can we as a community support each other's well-being. Obviously, you've done a lot as governor to reach out. How do you see your role or us as citizens in terms of supporting each other through what is a very tough time for people's emotional well-being, especially when, you know, there are so few options for some people in terms of what else they can do for their well-being? I, look, I think that's right. And one aspect of, um, of, of this role is, is communicating with the community. Um, a lot. And we did it last lockdown and we've done it this lockdown. And when you communicate with people, you don't expect them uh, to, particularly if you do it by way of a letter or, or email, you don't expect them to respond. It's not the reason why you do it. But last year and now this year, so most recently, uh, we've written to uh, every hospital in the greater metropolitan area and now we we'll probably have to go to John Hunter, um, who have COVID wards, have COVID cases, because you know that's particularly stressful. And um, one a general manager of a hospital put on link, put the letter on LinkedIn, and with the comment, "Look at this, personally addressed, and on beautiful parchment." And it just seemed as though you know it it, it lifted. We've we, we had to do the mail out uh, to schools and the video. We did a video link and that went via email uh, to the schools because there's you know, three and a half thousand schools or something in the state. We just can't possibly uh, do that by hand. But again, the responses just kept coming back. Oh, to have received that on a Friday morning after such a dreadful week. I can't tell you how much it made us all feel valued. And that's a word that comes through. Valued and not forgotten. That seems to be the big message. In terms of what, so, so I mean, I can do that and, and I consider that to be just um, a significant part of the community role. What can one do as an individual? That's interesting. I had a, a Zoom meeting the other day with uh, an organisation which sits uh, down behind William Street called uh, Beehive Industries, which has got nothing to do with honey. Uh, it's only got to do with um, a, a social enterprise business, which then supports isolated people in that fairly local community. The people are not homeless, but for the most part, they live on their own and they're elderly and they're not well off. They you know, would probably all be pensioners. And of course, you know, that had to close down on both COVID lockdowns. The manager there was telling me that when the people started coming back during that period when we weren't in lockdown, um, bingo was one of their big activities. He said he couldn't believe it that some of the people had forgotten how to play bingo in that three or four month period. And he was a little surprised by that, I think. And I guess in that situation, we're not allowed to travel very far. Um, and indeed, we're not allowed to knock on a neighbor's door. 
at the moment. Um, but I do wonder whether we can't be a little bit inventive, maybe uh, when we can knock on a neighbor's door, maybe do that. Um, or maybe go a few down the street and um, take a cake, <clears throat> take a cupcake. Um, just thought you might feel like this today. I know that almost sounds corny, but I just think at the moment, quite a number of those very small gestures are actually quite big gestures. And certainly making sure that our neighbours have access to food and, and other support if they're isolated seems right. I also just think that the lesson of your work, which is saying thank you and that we're thinking of people has a lot of power and that we can't do it with as a bigger megaphone as you do. And, and that's why your work is so valuable. But again, appreciation and noting uh, thanks. We were talking about that earlier with Andrew. I want to turn to the other aspect of um, well-being that you mentioned in your remarks in that uh, speech I, I referred to, which was collegiate well-being, which is an interesting way of framing collegiality. It's a word that we use a lot in workplaces today, it's certainly in universities, it has a certain meaning. How do you understand what it means to be a good part of a team, so a good colleague on the, on the bench or at the bar or in a broader professional context? What makes for good collegial wellbeing uh, inducing behaviour? Now that's a challenging question. Too given... general. <laughs> no, it's not too general, given, given the audience, which would probably be part of the one. Some of your former colleagues, indeed. Yes, one of the most competitive audiences, <laughs> or an audience of the most competitive people you could possibly uh, find because uh, they would not have been as successful as they were if they weren't competitive. Um, I think you can be very competitive, uh, probably against yourself, if I can put it in those terms, that um, at the bar I always thought that I just wanted to be the best barrister that I possibly could and I hoped that I was a good barrister, I really wanted to be a good barrister. So rather than trying to take out my opponent in any aggressive sort of a way, mostly. Um, <laughs> we all have our moments. Um, I really think I, you know, the collegiality is, is, um, is not being aggressive in that way. I think the collegiality is, is to find ways of being supportive. So in a court situation, I and mean, the Court of Appeal uh, is, is classic. Um, it can be a conversation. It can be uh, going down and seeking help from another barrister, another sorry, another, another one of your judges saying, I'm really stuck. I can't work out where I'm going with this. And sometimes the articulation of the problem brings you the answer. But I think just being prepared to uh, almost acknowledge that sometimes you can't work it out, you hit a dead end, um, enables that other person to open up to you and that builds in that builds in a in a in a unit, if I can put it that way. You know, whether that be a, a court unit or otherwise, with people know that they go away and have those. You can wander into any room and have that conversation. That builds amazing collegiality. And uh, I had that in the court all the way through. It was terrific. You could really go into any judge's chambers and um, and and ask and do you know a case. Uh, have, you know, if you come across this, it, it, it really is. And I, I think it's, I, you can put a number of um, labels on that. I guess the willing, willingness uh, to be open, the willingness uh, to be helpful, um, the willingness to share. There, um, I, I don't get into smoochy terms easily and I don't like labels because, you know, I, I think we, you know, we have to be pretty, uh, yeah, and, and, and pretty, and we also have to be intellectually rigorous uh, in the law in what we do. But I think there's ways and ways in which you can do it. And I think that's the way the collegiality builds up. And what about the line between collegiality and consensus? Obviously, you may not want to comment on this, but there's been a, a debate in the High Court in particular about the value of joint judgments versus separate judgments. Do you see that as an issue of collegiality or something quite separate entirely? <clears throat> Look, I think it's probably separate. Um, you know, I, uh, in various ways, did try to encourage uh, joint judgments, even if, if you were the writer. Um, some judges were happy to go along with that. Uh, some judges 
you know, really did like to express it in their own words. It was their way of, of working through the problem. Um, and I, in, in some way, and, and, and sometimes some cases were better suited to it than, than others. So that's very much a, a one size fits all, you know, the one size fits all just does not work. Um, and, you know, when you do see, when, when you've written judgment and you see another judge the way another judge might go about it, I mean, that, that adds, I think, to um, first the, uh, the knowledge base um, and the process base. You know, you see the way other people think when you do that. And that's actually part of the appellate system that you have three or five or seven people thinking and, you know, coming to a conclusion and to know that there could be different pathways to the conclusion is itself very important, uh, not only, I think, for the jurisprudence of the particular court, but also, I think, for um, the development of the law generally. And in this regard, I think also for the benefit of the profession. The guidance for lawyers and advice mm. to clients. It's a very nice um, treading the middle path between two otherwise quite polarised positions. I very much like how you formulate that. In 2015, you wrote an article in the Judicial uh, Officers Bulletin about the role of intermediate courts. And obviously, we're now six years hence and, and you've been uh, in the governor's role for two of those. Looking from today's vantage point, do you have a sense of anything you would say that's distinctive about the role of intermediate versus the high court in, in any of these areas, separate versus joint judgments, the development of the law is an obvious one, but what in 2021 would you say is the role of the New South Wales Court of Appeal as an emblematic intermediate court of appeal that is sort of distinctive uh, from the role of other courts in the appellate hierarchy? In some ways, you could play this just as a numbers game. Uh, you know, the New South Wales Court of Appeal uh, really is the final determinant of um, about 90% of cases that go on appeal. And so therefore there's a huge role for its jurisprudence. Uh, and I think this is, uh, you know, really proved, proved to be the case in in a whole lot of areas in, in the last, say, say 10 years. Um, in the corporate sphere, for example, you know, where there has been a quite significant corporate work done in the Court of Appeal. Uh, I think it's uh, in, you know, spheres which were really uh, new and of massive public importance, such as, um, you know, the uh, misuse of public office uh, type uh, processes that were going on. I think the challenges to ICAC, um, where most of those were all, uh, I'll start, use the term sorted out, in the Court of Appeal, there's only, you know, relatively a few number of those that went up to the High Court. So I think it has um, a really important role. And, you know, I, I can say of my colleagues and and, and uh, those, those who followed, uh, it really was a very highly professional court. Um, you know, I, I do know at the time that I was there, I feel that I was, um, I had an, my inheritance was to have judges who were really very, very, very good judges. Each, you know, those those judges will each be remembered individually as top lawyers and uh, top jurists. And to be able to lead that court, you know, it, it's all about timing, and I didn't time that one. <laughs> Um, it's all about timing, but it really was a tremendous court and it's remained a tremendous court. It's always a great fortune to lead uh, a wonderful team in that way. And, you know, I'm sure others would agree with your assessment, both as to your colleagues and your own role in that, Governor. So a number of my colleagues, including people uh, like Professor Gabrielle Appleby, have written about the role of executive officers in thinking about constitutional issues. You might call this colloquially the role of the constitution outside the courts. And you're now in a role where you have an important constitutional function. 
Can you tell us a little bit what you think the role of the governor is, as opposed to, say, the courts, in construing the New South Wales Constitution? And do you think your prior training as a lawyer and a judge affects how you think about your constitutional functions as governor, as opposed to that more community function? Oh, I, I'm sure that uh, you know my training as a lawyer has added to uh, the way in which I, I look at things constitutionally. Um, I do have to say that uh, the Constitution of New South Wales uh, is not well known. It, you don't get many cases uh, you know, where the constitutional point is an issue. Um, but at this level, every now and then, there is a point about which you have to be knowledgeable. Um, even if at the end of the day you must, act upon the advice of the Executive Council, if you're not knowledgeable about the issues, then, and if you don't really begin to develop an understanding of the way uh, government works, then no, no governor in this country takes their Executive Council lightly, but I'm sure um, that being a lawyer coming into it, you're your sense of what you need to know is probably perhaps more refined than someone who wasn't a lawyer. Uh, but having said that, there's an awful lot of lawyers who are governors at the moment. And in terms of giving it an interpretation to the Constitution as it's necessary, there isn't that much guidance from the Court of Appeal, as you've suggested. And do you think that there is a sense in which one has to, in a routine way, think about your constitutional function, or it's only in a crisis that one really has to form an independent judgment about your role uh, under the constitution. Well, a crisis helps. <laughs> crisis, crisis. <laughs> Very much so. No, but um, look, one of, one of the reasons why I find it uh, important to uh, maintain a, an intellectual connection with the law is uh, because I actually see that as fitting into my community role in, in a very significant way. I, I've used the expression that uh, as, as a judge, my role was to apply the law uh, as a governor. I think I can have a role, which I do see as significant, in being able to inform the community of the law. And, you know, for that reason, you've got to stay up to date. Now, I don't say that I'm uh, assiduously reading the uh, law reports every night, but I certainly try to maintain a fairly close connection either through speeches or also attending seminars. And indeed, it was attending one particular seminar that I um, realised that there was um, a full court, a decision of the full court of the federal court relating to the exercise of the prerogative of mercy uh, in the Governor General's. Um, level. Although the challenge then was not to the Governor General's exercise of the prerogative, although a comment was made on that, it was to the um, advice that was given by the Attorney General. Now that's very important. There is a difference, I think, uh, because of the um, Section 61 uh, of the Constitution, as Federal Constitution tells us what the Executive does. We don't have that. But, you know, that to me, is something that we really need to understand. Um, we really need to have a, um, a, a knowledge of, really need to know where the developments are in that regard. And I wonder if you weren't a lawyer, you would be quite as um, sort of um, acutely aware um, of the need to keep up to date with those sorts of developments. You've talked about lots of Lawyer governors, I just want to let our audience know that I've got two more questions for Excellency and then we're going to open it up to questions from our audience. So if you'd like to start putting any questions you have for Her Excellency in the question and answer box, we would welcome that. So uh, governors who've come before you, Your Excellency, Roman Mitchell, Quentin Bryce, Kate Warner and Linda Dessau have also been distinguished female uh, governors. But they and others, obviously, are important people who you have in mind in exercising 
uh, your role. Are there any of those or others who stand out in your mind as that is the kind of governor I would like to be? Oh, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, it's an easy question to uh, ask and certainly more so to answer, but you know, you're very welcome to keep it in general terms. Look, certainly. Um, we, we don't meet very frequently as governors, um, but, but we do meet at least once a year, uh, more recently virtually, as we all do these days. Um, and, and it's terrific to know that you could ring any of the governors uh, if uh, you know you had a problem you know, or a concern. And uh, I got to know Kate Warner in particular, in that regard, uh, likewise, uh, Linda Linda Dessau. Um, I knew uh, Paul oh. Jersey. In any event, uh, I must say, <laughs> I tend. I haven't actually rung rung up um, he who we call Big B's in this game. Um, I'm little cuts. He's Big B's. Uh, certainly, we have conversations, you know, at the uh, when we meet as governors, but. Uh, I, I think distance there actually makes a difference. Um, I found that really, really helpful. Of course, Quentin Bryce uh, has said ring any time, and that's likewise sort of wonderful. Having said that, um, I have a relationship with David Hurley, and I do consult him on issues. Um, uh, Sir Peter Cosgrove uh, is a guest at the House uh, at various events uh, on occasions, and um, Peter is, uh, is, a, is a great companion and, and he has words of advice as well. So there is a whole range of people that, that you can go to. Um, well, it's wonderful to have those people to turn to and no doubt they feel the same. Have you had other mentors in, in the law or in your career that you want to sort of note before I ask you how you'd like other people to see you in terms of your, your legacy or role? Yeah, look, you know, mentoring is a late 20th century phenomenon, I think. Um, certainly in the way, you know, it was at the bar, um, there were really very few, there, there weren't really any mentors when I was at the bar. Um, but I did, over time, build up a friendship which became an extraordinarily close friendship with Jane Matthews. And, you know, certainly when I was offered the appointment to the federal court, uh, she was the person, you know, that I that I went to and spoke to her about it. Um, and likewise, when I had the um, appointment to the Court of Appeal. And I think, I think everybody needs someone they can go to. And that's what I think mentoring is actually all about. Well, I often say to my students that, you know, it's very difficult to, you know, have one mentor in many jobs, but you often are fortunate to have friends and, and people who advise and give opportunities who are a portfolio of mentors. And no doubt that's been your experience, especially in an era in which traditional mentorship wasn't as common. Nonetheless, I, I know- should, I should add um, the wonderful sister Jude, who's now Pat Malone, um, she, she was also a mentor. Um, as I, I think Stan was as well, you know, you could always go to them and um, and ask something. I can still remember in, would have been year 11, I think, you know, when we were sort of running into what levels we were going to do and she was my English teacher amongst other things. I asked her, you know, what to do and she said, read. <laughs> I would come back to reading. She said, just read all the time and read widely. And Sir Anthony Mason says that as, as well. Be as widely read as you possibly can. Quite difficult when you're really working at a pretty, you know, intense level, and you're reading all those books to your kids as well <laughs> uh, to keep up with your own reading. But uh, I, I use that really as an example of mentoring. You know, here I was, hopefully going to do you know, high-level English. I asked her. What was my best route to, to that? Just read a lot. Well, I, I've experimented recently with trying to get one's children to read one's work. It, it's had mixed success, but if one can combine it, it's always an efficient way to follow that wonderful adage. Um, 
I, I was going to note in closing, Governor, that um, you've had many associates and other young lawyers who've worked for you. I know how much you've been uh, an important mentor to them as well in the way that those wonderful nuns have been to you as well as Jane Matthews and others. Uh, and obviously one of the things you reflect on in your current role is, you know, how do I want people to, you know, remember my role? It sounds like your community focused role is so important to you, especially um, in, you know, the context of COVID where people need that so very much. Is there anything else you want to add about how you'd like people to say, oh yes, uh, you know, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, she was a, you know, insert the description, Governor, how you would like people to see the way you've conducted your role. Obviously, you've already had a significant impact and legacy as a judge and lawyer, which we're celebrating tonight. But when we reconvene in, you know, 10, 20 years to think about your role as Governor, is there anything in particular you'd like people to, to highlight or remember from how you've conducted your role? Look, I think, um, you know, I've mentioned, you know, the people who, you know, have been significant. But can I also say, uh, Chief Justice was always this door open person. You could really go in any time. And I think in, in many ways, you become in some ways a combination of the influences on you. And the fact that a door might be open to you any time uh, tells you that your problem is important. And at the end of the day, the, the community work you can do is, is you can't be doing it on a one-to-one -one basis as such. But I do, and I think I've already said this, get this sense that if people feel that they're valued and, you know, that they have importance in themselves and what they do is, is valuable, then I think you've probably done the right thing, whether you be the Chief Justice uh, or whether you be the Governor. Both those framed pictures are on LinkedIn and the way in which um, the Chief Justice speaks to young lawyers when he welcomes them, it's all of those very important moments that obviously last a long time for people who are at the other end of them and we're very grateful for them. So I have some questions from listeners. Um, one of our listeners says, uh, were there any considerations which helped you decide whether to accept the governorship? They're particularly interested in it from your own story, but also what if one wanted to become, what if one was an ambitious young professional thinking, maybe one day I want to be the governor too? <laughs> so that's a what made you take the job? Um, let me turn the question around a little bit. Um, Having gone through, you know, the profession when there really weren't many women, you know, there, uh, I began to listen to this phrase, um, you can't be what you cannot see. And, you know, sort of, you get a little bit sort of old and um, hardened on these things. You think, oh, really? Um, but I did. And of course, that's where you make a mistake uh, because you're failing to appreciate where others, how others feel and think. And um, the door I, open in, yeah, that you said before they close over, it's that moment of trying to throw them open for others as well. Yeah, yes, and I've, I've come to see how important that is. And, you know, I think if you can be a role model in, as it turns out, you turn out to be a role model, you don't set out to be a role model, but, um, you know, if, if people can take inspiration and feel so, you know, there is something out there for them, I think that's really important. In terms of being governor, um, there's not many of those positions around. <laughs> In fact, there's, Let me ask there's, you less of those, there's less of those positions in the High Court. So <laughs> I think you have to be uh, somewhat um, humble in your ambitions in that regard. What about, people talk about beauty. I mean, you have someone who has had a number of challenges in your career, you've obviously thrived on challenge. Was being the governor a new challenge or a sense of duty or both? Oh, look, I think it was a combination of, of a new challenge. And it, I've, I've talked about timing so many, you know, on a number of occasions tonight. For me, things happened to me at times which were really, 
uh, really quite propitious because, you know, I'd been judging for 26 years and that's a long time to be judging and, you know, to remain alert and interested and keen. Um, I was beginning to think I was coming to a point where I would have to decide whether I would leave in two or three years time uh, or whether I would uh, then put myself in for the long haul. And if I put myself in for the longer haul, I should <laughs> say, um, then I really had to make, you know, in making that decision, I was aware that I really had to feel as though I could remain, you know, very fresh and uh, very, very motivated. So I, I knew a decision point was coming, was coming, but I didn't know which decision I would make at that point of time. And then you get a telephone call and that's, um, it, it came at a time where I felt the court was in a really good place. I felt that, um, you know, I'd had an extraordinary experience and privilege in being the president of that court. And um, this, I suppose, was the change that I might have made in two years time, I just made two years earlier. Someone else wanted you to reflect on what your best experience in your legal career has been. Obviously, it's going to be hard to top president of the Court of Appeal, but maybe there's another experience. Look, it, it, I probably would have to be as, as president um, of the court, but there, there's a bigger experience. And I think that is really you know, being amongst uh, people who are, are intellectually more than capable, um, intellectually rigorous, uh, and to become friends. I always say that's, to me, the greatest, you know, satisfaction of an academic job is the time and opportunity to talk with, you know, so many brilliant people and enjoy their friendship as well as their academic challenge. What advice would you give to a, a high school student? I'm very delighted that we have high school students joining the Mason Conversation who would aspire to pursue a legal career. Go for it. It's, it's a, great, uh, <laughs> a great piece of advice. I'm minded, you know, of, we still sometimes have people thinking it's out of reach um, and, you know, Not for it. anybody. Not for anybody. Yeah. So go for it. Um, Someone wants to get the, the governor's reading list. Matt, you know, Barack Obama made a, um, a specialty of, uh, you know, making book recommendations. Maybe that's the next thing for Government House is to have the governor's uh, recommended reading. Any suggestions of things you've read recently that you've enjoyed or you'd like to share with us as something else people should be reading? Uh, that's interesting. I do tend to like history. I have to do quite a lot of reading um, around for the job anyway. I've actually done quite a lot of reading uh, around uh, Indigenous uh, issues, which has, you know, been, you know, very, very rewarding. Um, I loved um, a gentleman from Moscow, uh, which fitted all, everything that I liked, like the history, like the, the story. Uh, there were times which were just, you know, amazingly funny uh, about that. So that was a great novel. I really did enjoy that. I like reading on China. Uh, and I've read a number of very uh, interesting books on China, but just two. Uh, one was called Chinese Lessons, and that was a book that was recommended to me. And that was uh, the story of John Pomfrey, the uh, American journalist, who went to Nanjing University. Uh, I think he was the first foreign student uh, to study, certainly at that university, but probably uh, in China after the Cultural Revolution. And he tells the story of his classmates um, and their ex experiences during the Cultural Revolution. And that's, it, it's, it's great storytelling, but it's also, it gives an insight, I think, into what China, you know, how China developed and came out of the Cultural Revolution. And there's also a book that I read um, recently, which I've just lent to a friend, friend, so I can't quite remember the name, but it's, um, some of that foreign correspondence in China. And it's a story of uh, many of the foreign correspondents who we recognize by name, who 
went to China really towards the end of the cultural, rev uh, cultural revolution and beyond. Um, and, and their first years in those opening up uh, of China and their experiences, you know, in a country which was uh, at that stage uh, still learning to come to grips uh, with with itself. And I found that very fascinating as well, you know, just to get those day by day experiences. Someone talking of, of Chinese uh, uh, reading, one of the questions is about your interaction with foreign governors or governors general or presidents. Obviously, you assumed your role, you know, right before we went into a, a kind of period of isolation. But did you have an opportunity before that to meet foreign heads of state? And do you see a future in which your role once again involves engaging the world? And if so, how do you uh, see that part of your role? It's very interesting. Um, now, the only uh, really foreign leader that I've met is uh, Governor Ma, uh, the, the governor of uh, Guangdong province. And Guangdong province and New South Wales have a sister state, a sister province relationship. Um, and that was an interesting visit. And I have quite a lot of um, engagement with the individual consular uh, core here. Excuse me, just shut that down. Sorry about that. Um, what I have found uh, interesting in that is that particularly overseas, the role of the governor is a respected role. And in matters of trade, and, um, and and cultural exchange, it's probably called you know super soft diplomacy or spongy diplomacy. But you can actually have more of an effect than you might imagine, particularly given that you can't actually initiate any trade relationships. You can't put any trade relationships in place. But I think the fact that again uh, that the governor's role is, is or, you know the governor sees it significant enough to speak to you know, the head of a foreign, whether it be a state, uh, well, so far it's only been a state, uh, does seem to have an impact. And that's also been the case um, with some of the consul generals and indeed even with some of the diplomatic corps. Well, I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing that you're on the job of soft diplomacy. We need as much of it as possible, and I can't think of anyone better conduct, to conduct it, and no doubt it'll be a bigger part of your role in the future if travel is once again possible. Someone asked a question about, if you like, taking yourself back to your earlier professional career, and it's obviously a dilemma this young lawyer is grappling with, is how did you think about representing clients who you found your own personal philosophy somewhat against? tell the funny story about your client having to pay his nine dollars but the more serious point about some corporate interests or other elements of the community where one might have found it very difficult to represent those people or those interests how did you think about that and would you have any advice for young lawyers grappling with that dilemma look i think the, the rules that are there um really assist you with that um you know, you, you are you are a lawyer. Uh, it's your job with client uh, to take uh, the client's problem or issue uh, in hand, understand it, and provide the legal advice that um, is is appropriate to that. Now, if it's a litigation matter and they don't take the advice. Then again, you know, the, the rules are pretty, I'm going to use the word expansive on this because provided that you don't say anything to the court, um, which really is wrong, you know, you have the right to argue uh, for your client. And sometimes, sometimes uh, a court case doesn't involve a total loss. Sometimes a court case uh, involves an outcome uh, which is just not black and white. You know, you may end up with an outcome for a client that whilst you've actually lost the case as such, you may have um, 
not lost it. You may not have lost it on every point. That may not, that won't change the result, but if it involves damages, you may end up with um, a damages result, uh, which is better than what was being claimed, uh, might even be um, better than what you thought was possible. But really, I often say uh, in an ethics discussion that the best place to start is where um, is, is to work out what the rules allow you to do. And if you work that out, you should be able to represent that client in all good conscience. Now, if you're going to take ethical stances, or sorry, philosophical stances on these things, or stances which are against what your own personal thinking is, then you probably should pull out um, and not act for that client. Um, you know, we've all acted for clients uh, who you might know are guilty in one way or the other. Uh, but, you know, on, on, on bigger issues, bigger corporate issues these days, you know, provided you're not doing something illegal and the client's not doing something illegal in the way the client is making you run the case, then the client's entitled to representation. I think the rules guide us and, and make it both easier and harder. And I think the easier is, as you say, Your Excellency, the point of one has guidance about what you can't do, which also allows one to know what one can do. Although obviously some young lawyers are not in a position to withdraw and therefore will find harder choices than if one is a, a more experienced barrister who has more autonomy as to the kind of matters one might work on. We've talked a little bit about hours and those 10 years of sleep you're never going to get back again, but are there any other downsides to a life in the law? We've talked a lot about the positives in your career and, and where it has made a difference to the community and also a, obviously a career that's been satisfying for you. Are there downsides to a career in the law that you, you think are worth reflecting or noting? Not many. I mean, time deprivation is the big one, but that goes, I think, in any profession. Um, what, what I do say uh, to people that if you don't, if you find you don't love it, if you if you don't love, uh, you know, the thinking process behind the law, um, maybe the law is not your career. Uh, because I think it, it is hard. It is a hard profession. It's a challenging profession. Um, it's physically challenging because of you know, the long hours, it's intellectually challenging, which is fantastic. Um, but if you really don't like it, I, I really think the best advice is don't do it. But, if you, you, it. but if you love it, if you like it and you love it, despite the times when it's very hard, it'll be fantastic. And when did you know that you loved it? Day one. <laughs> Seems to happen. <laughs> For me, it was day four because the first three days were corporate training and uh, that they were not the law. But after that, I agree completely. You you had this lovely phrase, <clears throat> you can't be what you can't see. Someone else has asked, are there any other pieces of advice that you were given along the way? We've heard of Sir Anthony's wonderful piece of advice at the beginning. Don't write too much, write, you know, write just the right amount. Any other pieces of advice that you remember or that stand out that you would like to share? with some of our, uh, you know, younger audience. I'm not, I'm not so sure that it was advice that I was given because I wasn't given very much advice. Um, but I think it's really quite important to, um, I suppose, keep at it. And again, if I can just do it by way of experience, when I, um, stop being rejected off floors of chambers and acquired chambers. Um, it was it was on a floor where the corresponding set of chambers in Southern Wentworth had rejected me. Um, and I just, and a number of other chambers had rejected me, and I just thought to myself, you know, I'm just going to come here every day and I'm going to hopefully get some work and I'll stop being an oddity because I'll just sort of be kind of the same chap, almost. In other words, um, 
I, I think you just that in those times when it's hard, I think you might have to make a decision if the career is not right for you. But if you if you know the career is right for you, I think you just have to sort of churn through those hard times somewhat, and um, and and you, and you learn a lot that way. You know, you you sort of become become tougher. You learn how to deal with more situations, and that just keeps going. Well, there's no better piece of advice than uh, for our current times than, you know, push through and keep going and there'll be uh, rewards at the end of it. Uh, I've basically answered, uh, asked most of the questions that we had from our audience. There are a couple of more, which I'm very sad we don't have uh, time for, but uh, lots of really interesting questions and clearly a very engaged audience. We've had at least 230 people join us this evening, Governor and um, it's a Monday evening, which just is testament to how much interest there is in hearing about the, the, the life that you've lived in the law. And as Andrew said at the beginning, it certainly has been uh, a life well lived. We are very, very grateful to have heard about uh, the beginning of the journey at home and reading those books uh, to those feminist nuns who made you think about existentialism and the sexual debates of the day into your time at the bar. I'm never going to forget the image of you bouncing up onto the roof and down again, although I'm not sure I fully understand the metaphor. I got the idea. The idea we then get lunged, pulled back to the, you know, the argument and you prevailing in, in at least in first instance in the federal court. Together we've reflected on gender and how far we've come in opening the door, but there may still be real work to be done on care and implicit bias in particular. I'm not sure that uh, the rest of us are going to manage the early morning solution that you've proposed, but we'll keep working on finding alternatives and uh, hearing you that we need to take the opportunities that have been created. And of course, many people on this call have paved the way for those sorts of changes, and we're very grateful, and Her Excellency is one of them. I've heard about wellbeing and how we can stop going to seminars about it and start doing it, going for walks, going for swims, reaching out to each other as neighbours and friends and possibly just doing some yoga. Uh, what it makes for a collegial judge and a collegial lawyer, having the door open, being supportive, willing to uh, give advice, give answers, but also to ask questions and open yourself up in that way. I think the bravery of asking is as significant as the generosity of answering. Her Excellency has reflected on uh, the role of intermediate courts of appeal. She's been completely diplomatic in saying that they play a distinctive role, which in no way detracts from the role of any other court, but highlighted the particular role that the Court of Appeal has played in various areas, including in relation to ICAC and limits on its jurisdiction and other important areas of New South Wales law. We've heard from Her Excellency about the role of the Governor in thinking about the advice that uh, she's given by uh, the Governing Council, and of course, the role of being a lawyer. It equips you for everything, it turns out, including being a thinking and question answering governor, the many wonderful people who've come before her and the advice and its support she's got from so many different colleagues, including the Chief Justice and Jane Matthews. And we've ended with some excellent advice. Let me re recapitulate the advice. Advice You can't be uh, what you can't see, although the governor's proved the uh, exception to that rule. Don't write too much, except if you're writing a law exam right now and listening to this as a break, you can write some more. And thirdly, keep pushing through even as we all face what is undoubtedly a huge challenge for our state and our community. Governor, you've got an incredibly busy schedule giving comfort to people at the front line uh, of the fight against COVID and we're very, very grateful that you've spared an hour and a half uh, this evening for us and with us to reflect on what has been really a dazzling and very significant career. Uh, we thank you very much for joining us. Dennis, of course, your husband for listening in and sharing what is a celebration of your career this evening. And on behalf of the faculty, we're very, very grateful. Thank you again also to our audience for their wonderful questions and for joining us and to our team here at the faculty and the centre, Danielle and Tom, for all the work they did in making this evening possible. So thank you all very much. Uh, it's been a delight being in conversation with you, Your Excellency, and I hope that the faculty will continue to engage you in conversation for many years to come. Thank you, Ross. It's been wonderful. Thank you.